Hello and welcome. Today we're going to be talking about the juvenile justice system. We're going to be delving deep into the bureaucracy that has grown out of the social need to manage what society labels as people that deviate from social norms by committing status offenses or crimes. We are not going to be delving deep into the qualitative experiences of individuals and groups interacting with the juvenile justice system and how that can benefit them or has caused problems and etc. Um, but we'll delve into that a bit a little bit later in a different chapter. But today we're really going to be focusing on the system itself, which is absolutely the realm of sociology. Again, a huge part of sociology is being able to understand systems and how they function, whether it's a bureaucracy like the education system or the government, the economy. Again, we're looking at these macro perspective of how society works. And one of the forms of social controls that are built into society is the juvenile justice system in America. And so your book opens up talking about the history of it. But again, realize that as civilization has grown, as the United States has grown, as we've had mass urbanization where people have moved to cities, you had uh, larger frequencies of types of crimes and this general need to be able to deal with people that may struggle with families or kids that are homeless or whatever it might be. So over time, we've built things like we had orphanages for a long time. Like the first person to start an orphanage was this dude in England who got sick of walking over the dead babies in the streets that they called gutter babies at the time during the early ages of urbanization. And so he decided to start the first orphanage. And when he opened the first orphanage, mothers were lined up to drop off their children because it was during a time where mothers were really struggling to take care of their kids due to mass inequality and this is again during the like late 1800s early 1900s where the lower social classes were being oppressed by the upper class and you didn't have like 40 hour work weeks and child labor laws and all of these things and so we were highly taken advantage of <clears throat> but again how people find them way in the crime and this general crime that's grown over time does evolve over time, okay? And so over time, we saw more people, we saw larger needs of crime. So we started building bureaucracies like polices in every city, sheriff's departments, um, judges in towns, whole criminal justice systems, prosecutors, lawyers, system to certify those prosecutors and lawyers, an entire administration staff that does all the background stuff that you never see for IT people to deal with the tech you're delving into a massive bureaucracy. So again, how did we get here is a huge question. And has our bureaucracy grown and why? But again, the whole purpose of it is, is to manage society. It's a form of social control. So over time, we have implemented prevention programs ranging from biological and psychological interventions to group therapy, gang interventions, recreational activities, job training, employment, community organization, structural reorganization of the entire society, and building things to hold people and lock them in, like jails and things along those lines, courts, etc. Okay. But are, is the bureaucracy that we built effective? Is it achieving our outcomes? What's the overall purpose? Is the criminal justice system exclusively there to lock people down? Or is it to rehabilitate and reintegrate people in society? And so you've had a lot of critiques that our criminal justice system is just this mass-produced way of incarcerating tons of people, and it's not really giving them these skills when they leave jail to be able to get out into the world and be able to succeed. It's also costing huge amounts of money. And again, like you've seen a reduction in marijuana crimes because how many people start out getting arrested for some weed, then they get caught up in the system. And before you know it, it just escalates from there. And that is, there's so much background story and how that disproportionately affects black men, for example. They get pulled over or targeted for something petty like that. And then once they're in the system, it's all over. It's that kind of thing, okay? So again, our system has evolved over time. It serves a purpose, which is to manage and to social control and to rehabilitate. But we have to look at the bureaucracy and ask, is it effective? Is it achieving our outcomes? What exactly are our outcomes? Are they clearly stated? And again, this kind of thing changes over time, okay? So we do have the OJJDP, and I love using this website for statistics. So please check this out. But the uh, Office of Justice and Delinquency Prevention is, um, they are supposed to deal with, they 
this is like the head bureaucracy that overrides everything and they're tracking the most serious and violent juvenile offenders and like over time they're the ones who kind of dictate policy and how that we should address these problems so for a while there they were going after serious and violent offenders as a way to reduce it because they're the ones who commit the most chronic crime so if we can target them we can help them um, we could also look at things like prevention as a critical first step but again how do we do it how do we set up a world where people don't commit as many crimes and is that ever realistic? And so should the justice system just be there to manage the people that are committing crimes or they should also be finding a way to prevent crimes too? And so again, where does it overlap? Who sets the policies and who dictates the action plans for reducing crime and then who manages the crime that exists now? And if we are going to reduce crime, how do we suggest doing that? Which we'll talk about here in a little bit. But a number of primary and secondary prevention programs have been implemented since the beginning of the 21st century, uh, 20th century using neighborhood groups, family schools, youth gangs, and social and mental health agencies as points of intervention. Unfortunately, most of these programs have been disappointing. We're going to talk in a little bit about some of the interventions that we you know, tried to deal that can reduce crime, but the only real way to reduce crime is increase education, increase access to jobs, and change the culture. Essentially, that's the best way to do it. And then, of course, you know, a lot of things tend to go down. Uh, so for juvenile prevention programs, the book talks about three different levels of delinquency program. There's primary preventions, which is looking at modifying conditions in the physical and social environment. Okay, so again, what's the root of people ending up in the system? Okay, so here we have our primary prevention, looking at the culture of the neighborhood, looking at accountability, whether it's from the family or whether it's from the community, looking at education level, looking at poverty status. Secondary prevention is intervention in the lives of juveniles or groups identified as being in circumstances that dispose them to delinquency. This also takes place in diversionary programs in which youngsters in trouble are diverted from formal and juvenile justice systems. So again, these people that get caught up in these worlds, even if we can't change the social context, how can we change the treatment to actually mold their lives in such a way where they're not necessarily just being locked down and taught no skills, but to guide their lives maybe in a way where they can learn skills, get an education, get a job, and decide to not commit crimes because they want to live you know, a life of just working like the rest of us. Tertiary prevention is directed at the prevention of recidivism and takes place in traditional rehabilitation programs. So those are the three that the book talk about. Um, but the book does have a good list of promising prevention programs, despite the fact that we haven't been able to take like a huge chunk out of crime. What actually has taken a huge chunk out of crime, again, guys, is keeping people off the streets and everybody on their phones seemingly with technology or maybe the culture of this generation just commits crimes. But again, remember as we're talking about this, that crime is down by half, okay? With the one exception of juvenile murder, that was up by seven individuals, only seven out of the percentage points, but seven people. But again, how much of that's due to access to guns? But we've seen a big effects with big brothers and big sisters. Uh, this program found 46% likely to start using drugs, 27 less likely to drink, and 32 less likely to hit or assault someone. Bully prevention program, uh, this found a decrease in bullying. Um, that was great. Functional family therapy, um, this one found a reduction of 25 to 60% of long-term offending. Incredible years, this is a curricula designed to promote social competence and prevent, reduce, and treat conduct problems in young children, which is hugely important. Um, life skills training, giving people the access and skills so they can build a better life. Midwestern Prevention Project includes score normative environment change. What can we do about the culture of school to create more positive social con contributors, I guess is a way to say it. Multidimensional treatment foster care. This is for adolescents who have chronic with problems with chronic antisocial behavior, delinquency, and emotional disturbance. It's a cost-effective alternative to group or residential treatment, confinement, and hospitalization. Multi systemic therapy. Program evaluations have revealed 25 to 70% reductions in long-term rates of re-arrest and 47 to 64% of reductions in out-of-home placements. Nurse Family Partnership Model Program, this one I found super interesting. This is going at like the what, you know, mothers in poverty, helping them get set up, set up the mothers in poverty better, then you can set up their kids better. Love that idea. 
project toward no drug abuse, participants in 40 schools revealed reduced uses of cigarettes, alcohol, marijuana, and had hard drugs just by learning knowledge, promoting alternative thinking strategies, a comprehensive program for promoting social and emotional competencies. Again, just a bunch of stuff that your book suggested. And then we have the Juvenile Justice Violence Prevention Programs, again, spearheaded by the OJJDP. This belief emerged in the 1990s that the most effective strategy for juvenile corrections is to place the thrust of the prevention and diversion emphasis on high-risk juveniles. And so again, it's like a top-down theory, right? Go after the high-risk ones, and then maybe that'll reduce the whole pyramid of chaos that follows. Again, how effective is this? Uh, these are the youths whom officials are quick to transfer into the adult system when states' laws permit a transfer. At the same time, the seriousness of their behaviors has affected changes in juvenile codes across the country. Research is beginning to find that these high-risk youths can be impacted by well-equipped and well-implemented prevention and treatment programs. Here, I always like to ask, okay, one, what is responsible for making a kid become violent? Is it the biology of the child? Is it the psychology of what they're experiencing? Or is it the social context? So again, yes, all humans have this tendency to be violent. And yes, there are certain psychological and behavioral structural issues, chemical imbalances that are associated with violence. But how much of violence is learned? And so again, if we just chalk off someone because they committed a violent act super young. And so this kind of says, look, Maybe there's a way to avoid that. Yes, they did this, but why are they doing this? Can we put them in a position where they learn that that's not proper behavior and learn more pro-social behavior instead of the anti-social behavior that they probably learn growing up in the environment that they're at? Advocates also presume that in order to reduce the overall level of violence in America, uh, successful intervention in the lives of high-risk youth offenders who committed about 70% of violent juvenile offenses is necessary. And then the general characteristics of these programs is that they address key areas of risk in youth lives, seek to strengthen the personal and institutional factors that contribute to the development of a healthy adolescent, provide adequate supervision and support, and offer youth a long-term stay in the community. So again, do we just chalk someone up because they engaged in something in the past? Do Can people come around? As a society, should we give second chances? And if so, how can we set them up so they don't come back, so they don't do that twice, so that they want to contribute and be a positive member of society? So diversion is something you hear about a lot. And I like the diversion programs because it's a good way to catch kids who are making huge mistakes when they're young. And instead of causing this to go on their records, they can enter these juvenile diversion programs which refers to keeping juveniles outside the formal justice system. And usually this is done through uh, like a drug court or maybe through a probation or some other outside agency. But again, this is a good way that to check them early instead of getting them completely in the system. It basically says, look, you made a mistake. You can own up to that. You can do this. Don't make any more mistakes and you'll be good. However, if you make a mistake, then we add on that charge to whatever charge you just did. And that's generally what happens. So with the diversion program, they postpone the charge until you complete the program and then it gets dismissed. However, if any time while committing the, during the program you commit a crime, then that charge comes back up. Um, so youth courts, youth courts, again, back into the bureaucracy, it's complex, right? Because you have the whole justice system, then you have the juvenile justice system, and then you have all the little branches of courts and police that stem out of this authority that is granted to the government. And then each jurisdiction, each city, each municipality, each state then has its own rules, and then there's the federal rules also that come into play. And again, this is where we need lawyers, which I am not a lawyer, so again, check into that and go a little bit deeper. Um, but again, in 2010, we had over 1,050 youth court programs. So again, that's all these different cities and all these different states have bureaucracies built with the administration, the judges, the lawyers, the clerks, the jailers, the jails, the bailiffs, the bail bondsmen, this whole entire process, right? So we have this across the country in all kinds of different places. And so realize that this bureaucracy itself is managing a very large caseload. I mean, you're talking about, you know, a million plus cases every year. And so 
you know, with the adults, it's what, 20 million cases is something like that. 10 million crimes. I want to say it's 10 million crimes for adults. Now I have to look up, of course, how many specific statistics there are. Um, but again, when we kind of looked at the effect of juvenile drug courts, for example, and diversion programs, um, we found that they tend to do a good job of helping use reduce their symptoms of emotional problems and reduce their substance use as measured six months post intake. So there can be some positives, okay? The juvenile justice system today, so the juvenile justice system is made up of three basic subsystems. Again, the police, the juvenile courts, and the corrections. And we have like a chapter on each one of these. That consists of about 10,000 to 20,000 public and private agencies. And then each one of these has how many employees, okay? With a huge budget of hundreds of million dollars. There's an entire business built into this, right? The basic work of the police is to maintain order and enforce the law. The juvenile courts, they're responsible for disposing of cases referred to them um, by intake divisions of probation departments, juvenile probationers. Uh, they make detention decisions. They deal with child neglect and dependency cases. They monitor the performance of youths who have been adjudicated delinquent or status offenders. And the parents' patriot philosophy of the juvenile court charges the court with treating rather than punishing youngsters appearing before juvenile judges. But, I mean, does that actually happen? I mean, when you think about the juvenile justice system, is treatment in the forefront or is it just managing the crimes and sentencing stuff out? And so, again, as a system itself, we've definitely kind of gone down that ladder. We don't focus on okay, let's get some social workers in here. Let's get some psychologists in here. Let's get some of the things that they need to set them up. No, we just throw them in jail. Then we throw them on probation. Then we just expect them to not commit crimes anymore right after we throw them back into the same environment that they were in committing those crimes in the first place. Okay? So again, <laughs> you know, if the parents patriarch says that's our goal are we really being effective what's the purpose of the justice system what exactly is it doing sorry i meant to move some of these pictures my bad uh but the correction system then is charged with the caring of youthful offenders juvenile probation deals with people when they're outside day treatment and residential programs they prepare they prepare people from going back into the community then you have your long-term juvenile correctional institutes to deal with the in-house people then you have your aftercare officers that take care of people after they've been seen in the system and so again these are the stages of the juvenile justice process and again you can see it's like oh my god right like where does it even start <laughs> Somewhere down here, over here. No, but again, you commit a crime, right? Then you go before the judge. Then the judge and the lawyers and the prosecutors all work it out. And then they decide what they're going to do with you. If you get char if you actually get found guilty, right? You either go into a diversionary program, or maybe you go into a treatment program, or maybe you go to jail. And then each bureaucracy is branched off to deal with this. And then when you get out of jail, right, you have your probation officers that watch you until you flatten your sentence to make sure you don't commit a crime. And then you might just get scheduled to probation and not have to go to jail. And then you have, you know, drug and treatment, alcohol people. You have your drug courts that are working with people while they're in jail and they're furloughing in and out. Again, it's an incredibly complex system. Welcome to it. But again, the basic correctional models, we have the rehabilitation model, which looks at uh helping a, a person's character their personality their behavior okay this is almost looking at behavior modification how can we adjust these teenagers behaviors to match up to social expectations that they can learn to get along then there's the justice model that holds that punishment to be the basic purpose of the juvenile justice system and i think we do have a bit of a mix but we mostly lean more toward the justice model in modern times if we were to do a general survey but you find that then you have the balance and restorative uh, justice, which again is helping the individuals recognize where they commit wrong so they can learn positive behaviors and then making it up to the victims in any way, shape, form, or possible. And then you have the crime control model, which is we need to deal with crime. It's a serious thing. People need social controls. I mean, we need to go out, get the criminals, lock them up, and make society safe. So again, just different ways of looking at it. Treatment in the justice system, you have insight-based therapy. This helps to resolve the conflicts and unconscious needs that drove people to crime. Again, adjusting the psychological problems. You have behavioral therapy, which is dealing with the psychological problems and learning to train your behavior in such a way that you can act in a way that can get along with others. Cognitive therapy is looking at dealing with your thoughts, your impulses, 
managing your cognitions and your emotions in such a way that you can act more positive. Group programs are especially helpful because it gets you around other people that are sharing these kinds of things. And, you know, that helps. Again, but what works for whom and what context is completely dependent upon the individual, the services that are provided, and things along those lines. You also have a graduated sanctions approach, which is, again, at first start out with a diversion. Next time they commit a crime, we put them in jail. Next time they commit a crime, we make it more serious. On and on and on. But again, which is the best way to deal with it? Race is always a factor because you have implicit bias in the police and the justice system. You also have implicit bias with things like gender. You know, it, we've, I talked about that earlier. Um, so again, race is a huge factor because blacks are more likely to be in poverty. Therefore, they're more likely to be exposed to a culture of poverty. When you're more likely to be exposed to a culture of poverty, you're more likely to be exposed to a culture of crime. Compounded by that, negative stigmas attached to minority races psychologically affect people and it gets into their head and affects their decision making and whether or not they're going to believe that they can make a good life for themselves or they're going to be oppressed because of the color of their skin. So again, race is always going to be a big factor. Um, juvenile homicide is higher for minorities than white youthful offenders for various reasons, including, again, that exposure to violence, exposure to crime, poverty, access to guns, whatever it might be. Um, so you're going to see that there are some factors. All right. You know, the justice system, this is just a quick introduction. Um, the next couple chapters, we're going to get deep into the police, the prosecutors, the corrections, the whole system itself, into what everybody does and the roles they play. But again, we should always be asking, what's the purpose of the justice system? And as we're implementing it, we're building this bureaucracy. Is it matching the mission statement and the overall outcomes that we're seeking to achieve? And so that's kind of the goal to be thinking about for this lecture. I appreciate y'all's time and thank you so much.